Thank you so much, John, for those warm words and that very generous introduction. One thing is true. I feel completely at home with the High Andes Church, and I'm so grateful for the wonderful work that you're doing to help mankind know what Christian science is. So I feel very privileged to be able to uh, speak to the members of the High Andes Church and to the High Andes community at large through this lecture. And there is nothing that can prevent us from being together. Space is not a problem. We're quite together, and I'm so grateful for this opportunity. When I see a group of people like you and like others, you know, I travel all over the world, and I give lectures very frequently in, in places where I don't know people, people who speak another language, who have another culture, people from all over the world. I learned one thing which has impressed me very much. Doesn't matter where I am, what's the culture, the language, the background, we have so much in common. There's so much that unites us, even though we've never met sometimes, we have much more in common than differences. There is a lot more that unites us with all mankind than differences. We just need to see how much we have in common, see the common ground, the commonalities, and how much we enjoy the same things. Everybody wants to have a good life, to have supply, to have peace in the world, to be able to feed their children. Everybody wants to give a, a good future for their, for their children. Everybody wants to live at peace with his neighbor. That's something we have in common, and that involves a lot of things. And that's naturally a desire that everybody has to have good in their lives, to enjoy a happy life. And that's not the same thing in different countries, but the desire to have a happy life always comes accompanied by some hope for a happy life. And whoever has hope, is in a way turning to a higher power, is aspiring to connect, to know, to see a power that governs and that will respond to our hope. I call that God, because even people who don't believe in God, they do have hopes and lift their eyes and their thoughts up looking for a better today or a better tomorrow. So I came to the conclusion that having hope has a lot to do with prayer. When we have hope, we are turning to a different power, to a different presence. As I said before, to me, that's God. So it's important to acknowledge some good in order to turn to that power and aspire to have more good. And people do that, and that is acknowledging in, instinctively to the fact that there is a higher power that governs the whole universe, that doesn't depend on what's our culture, what's our church, what's our religion. It doesn't depend on whether we believe in God or not. People do turn to a higher power. And to me, that's praying. I learned that, I arrived at that conclusion by studying Christian science, which is a religion founded and established by Mary Baker Eddy, an American woman of the 19th century, which is a follower, a devout follower of the teachings of the Bible, of Christ Jesus, and she is a deep, deep Christian. She wrote a book called Science and Health with Key to the Scripture, which is available to you after the lecture, where she explains how the Bible was her only authority and how in the Bible she found all the inspiration that was enough for her to give to the world Christian science. I always studied Christian science, and that's where I drew all these ideas. It's important to turn to God and understand God. It's not only a matter of believing in God, but understanding what God is. 
there are not many gods. This principle that governs the universe is the same for us, for our neighbors, for people who have other ideas, who profess other religion, they all turn to this one power. They can call it the way they want, but it is the same. There is only one principle that governs the universe. So we're going to talk about how Christian science helps us to look at that principle as available and applicable to people all over the world, doesn't matter who they are, or what they are, or their present circumstances. The Apostle Paul has a sentence which appears in the Bible in one of his letters, which says, pray without ceasing. I love that. Because praying without ceasing doesn't require a moment. It doesn't require for us to go somewhere in order to pray. It doesn't require being in a certain position. It's just acknowledging the existence of this infinite power that governs the universe, which is God, regardless of what we call that. But it's interesting that when Paul talks about praying without ceasing, the sentence that precedes that in the Bible is rejoice evermore. So it comes in that order, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. In other words, find some good to rejoice about. That's the first step. Even in the darkest and the most difficult situation, rejoice. And that leads you to pray without ceasing. You can do that all the time. Somehow. I like to talk about that in all my lectures. You may have heard me say that, that we pray by acknowledging that infinite power which is already present. We're not asking that power to do something, but we're acknowledging that that power governs us and is present wherever we are. Just to, I just said that to give an idea, you an idea of how much I love to think of God's presence and how we can, doesn't matter where we are, what we're doing during our day, we can pray. We don't need to wait until we take time to pray or to go to church. We can pray all day by just having small glimpses that God is present. That is a form, a simple form of prayer that helps us the whole day. I was saying this at a lecture in Switzerland some two or three years ago. I was lecturing in Europe, and then I had one lecture in Geneva. And I was going over these ideas and saying just that, repeating the Apostle Paul's words, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and telling the audience what I think it is to pray without ceasing and how we all can do it. And I realized that right in front of me, right in the middle of the first row, there was a nun. And she was obviously a guest of somebody whom I knew who was sitting with her. And I felt so grateful for her presence. I felt honored that she would come and she was wearing the, the, the veil and she had a crucifix. So I knew it was another, there was no question. And I felt very grateful for her presence. My heart felt so close to her. I, there, I had a tender feeling for her. I don't know why. It just moved me to have her there sitting right in the front row. Several times during the lecture, I had that tender feeling towards her. And I thought to myself at the end of the lecture, I'm going to go right there and say hello to her and feel, tell her that how honored and how grateful I feel that she came to my lecture. And I did that. At the end of the lecture, I stepped down and shook her hand. She took my hand in both her hands and with tears in her eyes, she said, you don't know how much you helped me. And then she told me why. She was assigned to a mission in Europe. She was a Canadian nun working in Geneva with the children in these refugee camps of people who migrated from the Middle East, in that case, and landed in Europe and were not allowed in and couldn't, 
go back. They had lost their home. They fled for safety reasons, fled looking for a better life and were not received. So they were in these refugee camps under the most horrible circumstances. And her assignment was to deal with the children. And she said what she saw was so appalling. She saw so much human tragedy and so much suffering among those children. She said there were very few people to help her in her mission. She was alone and she had so much to do. She was facing very, very sad circumstances every day. And she said she was feeling guilty because she had so much to do that she didn't have time to pray. And when I quoted St. Paul as saying, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. And I talked about how we can pray without ceasing no matter what we're doing. She felt restored. She said, oh boy, I can pray without ceasing. I can pray. I don't have to feel guilty about not praying. And that helped her tremendously. Well, her, my conversation with her was briefer than all this explanation. But as she said that to me, I felt I was so shaken up. It was like if somebody really had shaken me. And I said to her, and you don't know how much you are helping me. Because so far, I have been reading in the newspapers. I've listened to the news. We get it in our computers, the story of these tragic migrations that are going on all over the world today. To me, until this moment, those were news. I was getting it as news. This is the first time in my life that I'm talking with somebody who is directly dealing with the victims of these tragedies. So to you, the situation isn't news, and you brought me into this picture. So I have to thank you. You've helped me tremendously because now I feel that I too have to pray about those situations. They're not news that are happening over there in that country or in that territory and it has nothing to do with me and all of a sudden I thought this is in our backyard isn't it we each one of us has to do something about it it's not the nun that has to discover that she can pray all the time we need to do it each one the way we can we need to take it up and pray and help those populations of people that's what shook me up I thought I'm not uh, a spectator on this problem it's happening all over the world. I need to pray about it. So when I got that, I thought I would like to write about it and share it with the audience. So that's what we're going to talk about. How I felt that day and how I developed. How do I pray about those situations and invite you all to do that? It is not somehow over there, their problem. It's a humanitarian crisis in with what we learn from Mary Baker Eddy, we have elements of thought that enable us to help mankind at this moment, very specifically. You know, the, the tragedy of immigration is not something that I have never seen. I'm a sociologist. I studied sociology and politics at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And during my university years, I worked as the assistant of one of my professors in sociology. At that time, there were huge contingents of migrants that came from the north and north, the northeast of the country to Sao Paulo, to the south, looking for a better life, looking for jobs, looking for better opportunities. It's the same thing. People flee from a very tragic situation and go somewhere else hoping for a better future. And these people came in abject poverty, from abject poverty. And I was used to seeing them unload from the trucks that they, that they had been traveling for days and days and days in the most inhuman conditions. And when they arrived, I was wor working with the Department of Immigration for the government, helping to assign a location to those families, a piece of land for them to cultivate and evaluate what they were able to do and what kind of pieces of land they had available. So I worked for about a year with a professor in that. When I was working with that in college, 
once in a while I looked at those migrants and I thought, is God angry with part of his children? Where is God for, for this situation? And I found out that it's not a matter of asking God to do something. It's a matter of knowing what God is. And when we begin to know what God is, we begin to learn what God is not. Because a lot of people turn to something that isn't God. And then they wonder, is that God angry with his children? Well, God is not partial. God is not a statue. God is not a cultural entity. God is not in a little card depicting something. God is the principle that governs the universe. It's the mind that governs the universe. It's not a person. And again, it's not a cultural feature of some area. God is the principle that governs. If we can turn to that and trust that that principle is good, we can begin to feel the hope and the comfort that enables us to think and to help. We also need to understand what man is. How do we relate to God? How does God relate to us? God is not out there. God is right where we are. Not a physical being, but the mind that governs the universe. That's what God is. What does a mind have? Mind has ideas. And where are the ideas of mind? They are in the mind that thinks them. So man, each one of us, is an idea of God, an idea of that mind, and that idea is in that mind. So when we begin to understand that for ourselves, we begin to improve human conditions. Those thoughts have an effect in the human circumstance, and that's where we can participate. We can do something about that. We don't have to be static thinking it's happening over there. I don't have anything to do with it. We do, and we can. Every time we entertain the right thinking that each one is an idea of mind in the mind that made, made us, we're helping. That thought is not in vain. Even if we are not looking at certain people or seeing immediate results in our eyes, it is helping. That's not in vain. I learned in Christian science that this, in, this mind, which is God, is infinite. Now, if you stop to think of the word infinite, infinite means that has no end. So there is no place in this whole universe, as big as you can imagine it is, and it is infinite, this whole universe is not empty. You, you always think that we fill the place where we are and we see other people, other circumstances. We find ourselves in a room like you and I are now almost sharing the same room. But what's in between that infinitude of God's presence? God's universe is never empty. There is not one spot where the presence of that mind is not in control even though what we see doesn't seem to be that. The more we know it, the more we help. That infinite mind cannot be in conflict with itself. It doesn't have sides. It's not at war with itself. That infinite intelligence never lost sight of any of its ideas. Now, we said a little while ago that each idea is in the mind that thinks it. Because a mind is where ideas are. Mind is God. And that infinite mind is where all its ideas are. That mind, which is God, which is love, never lost sight of any of his children, of any of his ideas. God is not angry with a segment of mankind and finding that it is displaced or that it doesn't have a place to go or that it is unwanted or that it is fleeing safety, uh, lack of safety and finding itself driven into 
a place where there's no place to go or not, no place to go back. Mind doesn't do that with its ideas. The more we go to that thought and trust it, the more we're helping an infinite number of people that we don't even know. It's our trust in the fact that none of God's ideas are lost. And mind, God, didn't lose sight of them. It doesn't matter what they think God is or what they call God. We know that God is infinite and one. And that's our duty to pray. So I like to go to words of Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science. There's a compilation of her writings called Miscellaneous Writings. There are different speeches, sermons, and letters and bits and pieces that she wrote in the late 19th century. In one of those, there is a, a sentence that helps me a, a lot when I think of how universally we must go and think. She says, God is universal, confined to no spot, defined by no dogma, appropriated by no sect. That is a universal God. The divine intelligence, this infinite mind, this infinite intelligence that is filling the whole universe is aware of its own infinity. We can start the day knowing that. God is aware of his own infinity. God knows where I am. God knows where you are. That alone is a very helpful prayer. That kind of prayer doesn't interrupt our day. It doesn't interrupt our busy schedule. That kind of prayer is available to everybody all the time. It doesn't take time. And that's what the nun caught, that she could pray all the time. Now, we're talking about people who lost their homes and are looking for homes. And that has been a quest for mankind for a long time. We go back to thousands and thousands of years. We read in history, and you all have read, the history of different migrations. And migrations of great contingencies of people are always due to famine, oppression, injustice, lack of means, wars, disagreements. That's what generates migrations, whether it's today or thousands of years ago. In the Bible, there are stories of migrations. There are stories of people who were in this quest for finding home. There is a book of Psalms, and this one psalm written by somebody who must have felt that. He says, Lord, thou hast been our refuge from generations to generation. He was already thinking that God is the refuge and the home throughout the generations. That man must have felt the need for home, and he was looking for it in God. He says, before the mountains were brought forth, before the, the worlds were formed, from eternity to eternity, thou art God. It's interesting to see that this was written thousands of years ago by somebody who was turning to that God and knowing that that has been the refuge. That's the home. He knew that the intelligence that governs the universe never lost sight of his children or of himself. That's pretty old. And we're, we can apply the same ideas to our lives today, personally and impersonally. So... Man is never, has never been a spot in the universe, a spot in space without a place to go. Man is not a lost idea. And the mind that governs the universe never lost sight of any of his children. There's no foreigner in that infinite universe.
there is no immigrant that goes from here to there looking for something better. Nobody's outside of God's presence. Now, today, this has generated tremendous polemics and controversies and divisions. The world is polarized about, well, what are we going to do about it? Which way are we going to look when there is so much controversy? The controversy becomes political. We can see it in our own backyard and in our front yard. People who think the opposite way from other people and they, everybody thinks they're right about this issue of immigration and people that go from here to there with different cultures. That is polemic, it's controversial. It's controversial here, it's controversial in Europe, it's controversial in Africa, because it is not the truth about man. Man is in God's presence. So when we're looking at it in Christian science, how are we going to pray about that? We can think, which way do I go? Which side is right? And both sides can argue for being right so intelligently that if you're in the middle, you don't know which way to run, because the arguments seem to be valid. Well, I learned that when there is a controversy of that kind, it's better not to take sides. But to, not to take sides doesn't mean to be neutered and to be indifferent or to step out of it. It may, means not looking to one side or the other, but look up. Look to a higher solution. Look to something that you may not be able to see with your eyes, but trust. Have that hope, that trust that there is a power. There is a mind that did not lose sight of his children. Neither the ones that are migrating, nor the ones that are afraid that the migration is going to take what they own and deprive them of the goods. Let's not take either side. So we look up, not to the human perspective, but to the divine perspective. We lift our eyes away from the controversy and we stop getting excited about the controversy. And we find our peace on a higher level, a higher power. And we are able to do that when we begin to understand what is God and what is man. That helps to improve the human condition. As I said a few minutes before, migrations are not new for mankind. The idea of having or not having a home or where the home is, is not a recent thing. It's not of the last 10 years, 20 years, or 100 years. It's thousands of years old in the history of mankind. So I'm going to ask you a question. And I know I'm not in the same room with you, but I'd like to see some answers. Did Jesus have a home? Good question, isn't it? I'm, see, I'm sure people think, yes, he did. Others think, no, he didn't. Um, well, there's nothing specific about where his home was. But there are passages in the Bible that indicate that, he, of course, he did. Was Jesus poor? That's a very dangerous mistake to say that Jesus is poor and justify poverty because Jesus is poor. Jesus wasn't poor. He was a carpenter. He had a trade. He had a profession. Actually, a carpenter at that time provided goods for people who had a lot of money. So they were well paid. He had a profession. He, had, he belonged to a trade. That's not being poor. There was poverty in his time, abject poverty. He was not one of those. His disciples were fishermen. Fishermen had, again, they had a profession. They fished and sold the fish. They were not poor. Being poor was another thing. So again, Jesus was not poor. Did he have a home? Let's see what we read in the Bible. In the first chapter of the Gospel of John, at the end of the first chapter, verses 38-39, there is a scene that if you read it and think of it in real time, there was a group of people who had a teacher who was John the Baptist. 
And John the Baptist had disciples. He had his own followers. Actually, he was a cousin of Jesus. And two of John's disciples were walking nearby where John the Baptist was, and they saw Jesus coming up from the distance, coming towards where they were. By the time they were near each other, these two guys, two young men, they followed Jesus for a few steps, and Jesus realized these two guys were behind him. So he turned around and asked them, what do you want? And the two young men hesitantly said to him, Master, where do you live? Do you know what he answered? Come and see. So he invited these two guys to where he lived. We don't know the address, but they went there, and the Bible said, and they spent the whole afternoon there. They were guests of Jesus. So it looks like Jesus had a home, and he could invite people to go to his home. Now, Jesus was the best example of God's love. He was sent by God to help mankind. He never said that he was God. There is not a single passage where he says he is God. He mentions God as his father. He was very aware of where he came from. He was a, very aware of who the father was. And he was so ample and generous in saying that God was his father, that in the most important prayer he taught mankind, he said, he starts by saying, our father. He's including us and in being children of that father. So we should not think that Jesus was a privileged God. He was the child of God, the son of God. And he gives us the honor, the opportunity of being children of that father. Not you and me, but every man and woman in the universe. And none of these ideas is lost or lost sight of. It's interesting that Jesus also said, in my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. So what are those mansions? They're places where people can live comfortably, not houses made of brick and, and a roof. It's talking about the mental concept, the spiritual concept of home, and understanding what he taught. He was going ahead to prepare a place for everybody. That's not a place for one of us, privileged ones, but for you, you mankind, including those who are in refugee camps. Now, it's interesting that Jesus was the highest visible manifestation of God's love for mankind. He was God sent and he appeared as a human being. He was seen, we could, people could see him as a man. But what he taught, what he gave mankind, what moved him was the infinite love of God for mankind. And the action of that love for mankind, which sent Jesus for us to learn those ideas, didn't stop. That is what the Christ is. It's what Jesus gave us, what he taught us, the ideas he gave us. Those ideas are the Christ. Jesus isn't here anymore, but the Christ is. The ideas, the action of the, the love of God speaking to us, to human consciousness, telling all of us nobody's lost, nobody's displaced. That Christ is speaking to human consciousness forever. We can trust that. Even though Jesus is no longer here, the Christ is. Because of God's love, the Christ is the action of love and is speaking to human consciousness. Today, it shows the way to harmony. It shows the way to heaven. It's interesting that in Mary Baker Eddy's book, 
she very often equates the word harmony with heaven. She talks about heaven not as a place, a locality, or up there, but heaven is harmony. Finding harmony is finding heaven. And that's available to everybody. Now, Christ is that message, that action of love that enabled Jesus to talk to mankind then and the Christ to talk to mankind today. The word Christ is a Greek word and the word Messiah is a Hebrew word. Both mean anointed. And in Jesus' time, where he lived, there were a lot of people who spoke Greek. There was a great Hellenistic and Greek influence in that culture. So there were people who call him Christ because they spoke Greek, others that called him Messiah because they spoke Hebrew. They mean absolutely the same thing, and it means anointed. So Jesus was the anointed of God, both for the Jews and for those who were not Jews. They understood him. And the Christ, that action of love, which enabled Jesus to come with so much love from mankind, shows the way to harmony. It shows the way to heaven, not as a locality, but harmony right where we are. Echoing Jesus' words, Mary Baker Eddy says, there is but one way to heaven, harmony. And Christ in divine signs shows us this way. So the Christ is showing us the way to harmony today, the way to heaven. And she says, it is to know no other reality, to have no other consciousness of life than good. Have no other consciousness than good. Refuse to respond to evil. Refuse to participate in evil. That's the way to heaven, to God and his reflection. And that enables us, enables us to rise above the so-called pains and pleasures of the senses. So again, in the face of a controversy, there is but one way to harmony. It is to know no other reality, to know that even in the middle of tragedy, the reality of God is present, and we trust that. That's a form of, of non-stop praying, and that can help mankind. So we look up, away and up from conventional thinking to a different direction. We turn our thought into a different direction, to a different reality, the reality of God. To do that is an awakening, an awakening that is available to all of us. That awakening is a pilgrimage. That's the highest concept of home. Not a home for the future, not a home for the beyond, but a present possibility now for us and for all mankind. So our highest concept of home is right here and we have it. The Apostle Paul also said, if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Well, that house, eternal in the heavens, is not made of material elements. It cannot fall down. And that house, eternal in the heavens, is available now. It's not for the future. It's a concept. It's a thought. We can all move into that house right now. It's not, and it is not made with hands. It's not made of matter. And it is for now, not for the future. It's not for the beyond. It's for today. Then our concept of home shifts in a pilgrimage towards a higher, higher sense of home. A pilgrimage that shifts our concept of a material house to a concept of home in God's presence. 
Now, I've talked about different kinds of migrations, different reasons for migrating that mankind has moved around because of different reasons for migrating. Danger, poverty, oppression. There was a very special migration in the 1600s. It was a migration that happened from England to the other side of the ocean, our side of the ocean. And it happened to be a group of English people that were being prosecuted for religious reasons. And they wanted to move to a place where they could worship God free from political persecution. So they fled England across the ocean and landed in what is called New England, right here where we are. That migration, the first ones who did that migration were called the pilgrims. And their pilgrimage was not going to a, a new land in order to take the gold and the silver and go back rich. It was to settle and get established in a place where they could worship God freely. That's the origin of the United States. It's the only country that originated that way. So the people who wanted to worship God freely also wanted to defend that idea. And they were based on the Bible. They were students of the Bible. So they brought that Bible and that understanding of God to this country and started this nation. It's not surprising that 200 years later, a descendant from that migration discovered in the Bible, which was the biggest authority for all those people, the laws of God, the scientific laws of God that governed the universe and gave it to mankind, calling it Christian science or the science of Christianity. The Bible has always been for Mary Baker Eddy and for this country, a source of authority. It's important to look at the Bible as a dynamic record of human history in which the reality of God becomes apparent and is recorded. The Bible was written by different people. It's not written by one or two people and at different times. And it was written as a dynamic record by witnesses of how God reveals himself. So what we find in the Bible is the revelation of how God reveals himself. It shows how people understood God throughout different times in human history and how they defended the idea. There are so many people in Bible history who did different things to defend the idea of God that they were getting. So it's a dynamic record. It's not a dusty book of old history. And it comes all the way to today when people begin to understand the dynamic presence of God revealing himself. For Mary Baker Eddy, the Bible was not a book of tradition. She found action in the Bible. She found love in the Bible. She found healing in the Bible. She was being taught a very austere Christianity full of punishment, a God that if you didn't obey, something horrible would happen. A God that was wrathful. That was very common in the 19th century when she was growing up. She never could understand it. And she couldn't accept what she couldn't understand. Whatever wasn't clear to her in a logical way, she didn't accept. Actually, she was supposed to join the church of her parents, which at that time was called the Congregational Church, and she was supposed to be a member of that church and became a member of that church. In doing that, in the interview for admission, um, she was asked what any church membership would require. Do you accept what this church teaches? And she said she accepted everything because she, was, she believed in what the Bible tells except she did not accept the theory of 
condemnation or predestination or that some people were privileged by God and destined to eternal bliss, while others were not liked by God and were destined to eternal suffering. That's the, the way Christianity was taught in her time, and she couldn't take it. It didn't make sense to her. She explained to the pastor during the interview that she didn't agree with that, and she wanted to obey her parents. She wanted to join the church. She was so honest, so sincere, that the priest accepted her membership. And with it, her statement that she didn't agree with that, because for her, the Bible was a dynamic record of love, and she found healing when she read the Bible. So from early childhood, she knew the Bible was a dynamic record of God's revelation of harmony and of healing. So this wasn't easy on Mary Baker Eddy. She got married very young, mar married a man from the south of the United States, and went to live there. Well, we never thought of this, but Mary Baker Eddy lived in her own country, in an area where the culture was different from the one she was used to in New England, where there was slavery, where people owned people. She didn't like that. She didn't agree with that. So that was a challenge in her thought. She was happy in her marriage, but it lasted very little. Her husband died during the first year of their marriage. She was pregnant, and she had to go back to her father's house in the north so right there starts the pilgrimage of Mary Baker Eddy towards home. She lost her home in the South. She lost her husband. She's left with nothing. And she has to go back to her parents' house, which was not her house. At that point, her mother died. Her father remarried. And here she, is, she doesn't have a home. She's not homeless. Her family supported her in a way, but not the way that she would have liked. So this is her journey towards finding home, her pilgrimage towards home. There are many episodes, many times when she finds herself without having a place to live, living with very scarce resources in rented rooms. She still needed to understand God better. She knew what she had found in the Bible, the love and the intelligence development of the Bible was way above the idea of condemnation or of a wrathful God, but she had a long way to go. She spent very difficult years. And one day during those years, at this point she was already in her middle age, she suffered an accident. She fell and injured her spine. She was taken up, and it was said that she would never walk again. She agonized in pain for three days, and at, during that period, she read an episode in which Jesus healed. And she had always found healing in the Bible. She knew there was healing in the Bible. She reads this passage where Jesus heals a crippled man, and immediately, she saw something about the spiritual reality of God's presence. She pierced through the apparent opacity of matter. She pierced through that opacity and sees the light of God's presence in the fact that Jesus heals a man instantly. She felt the reality of God's presence she understood something she had never seen before. It goes beyond the theology of her day, beyond the stale um, teachings of right and wrong, but towards that heart of love that speaks to human consciousness and restores harmony to human experience. That then she got up and she was completely healed. And she went on to live another 45 years to bless mankind. She couldn't think that that was enough for her because now she was restored. So she spent the rest of her life studying and writing and teaching to give mankind what she had discovered. 
she was moved from faith to a reasoning of what God is. So she wrote Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures based on the ideas that came to her and made it available to mankind. Talking of herself as an author, because she had written several books, she says, after a lifetime of orthodoxy on the platform of doctrines, rites, and ceremonies, it became a sacred duty for her to impart to others this new old knowledge of God. New old knowledge of God. She wasn't teaching a theology. She was teaching a living understanding of God as love that enables us to find heaven, harmony, right where we are. And that is a prayer that helps all mankind. So it was years that she <clears throat> was looking for a home. And in 1875, she was able to buy a home. This is a woman in her middle age, without a husband, without much money. She was by then having a little income from the fact that she healed people. And she was able to buy a house and get a loan and pay it in a very short time. She was very modest about herself and very simple. She didn't want to have a palatial home. She didn't want to live in luxury, but she wanted to live in comfort and to offer comfort to those who lived with her so she could serve mankind. From that point on, she lived in beautiful homes always surrounded by her students and by her followers. Her only goal was to teach mankind what she had discovered, the healing power of the science of Christianity. It's interesting, she writes in the 19th century, which is the century of the sciences, is the century that put the world into the world of science. And she puts Christianity under a scientific tone because she discovers the science that Jesus knew. She made it practical and available for mankind today. She wrote about home. Home is not a place, but a power. She also wrote about home. We arrive home when we arrive at the full understanding of God. So we all can arrive home when we find a better understanding of God. We can help people all over the world with that thought and we can help ourselves. Is it possible to be so far away that we're far away from God and cannot obtain healing? Never. You're never far away from God. You're in God's presence, doesn't matter where you are. And at one point, I'll tell, I'll share with you an experience of healing. My husband and I were in Italy at one time and we were visiting Naples. We went to see Pompeii and visit the ruins of Pompeii. It was a tough day of walking. When we went, went back to the hotel, he was suffering from intense pain on his leg. The pain went from his waist, waist down to his toe. He couldn't move. He couldn't find a comfortable position sitting or lying or standing and he agonized all night. So we made a phone call to a Christian science practitioner in Buenos Aires, Argentina, where he was from and where he knew a practitioner. So here we are in Naples, Italy, and he called a practitioner in Argentina, several thousand miles away, and she said, you have never left the presence of God. You're not far away, you're not in a remote place where there isn't this or that. You are in God's presence. He hung up the phone and we held on to those ideas for several hours. At the early morning hours, the pain began to subside. It disappeared completely. We had a commitment for which we were picked up at seven o'clock in the morning and he was completely restored. And he never had that kind of pain again. What restored his calm, his happiness, and his health was a knowledge, an absolute certainty that none of us is ever away from God. 
God's presence is where you are and God knows where you are. Now, Mary Baker Eddy was an American woman. She spoke English. She had a totally American makeup. She breathed the atmosphere of independence of the United States because she was born in 1821. That's only 45 years after the United States became independent. So her parents and grandparents had participated in the atmosphere and the thought that gave this country the makeup it has of freedom of speech, of press, and of religion. She comes from that principle of freedom. And she was raised with that thought from her parents and grandparents, grandmother. Then she herself discovers the Christ healing that Jesus knew and taught. She practices it. She heals herself and other people. Does that make Christian science an American religion? Now think of, for instance, Thomas Edison. He was a scientist, he was American, and he was able to work with certain principles of electricity and produce the electric light. Why didn't we have electric light before him? Because we didn't know how to make it. All the principles that existed a thousand years ago and that existed in Edison's time were the same and they were there, they're there now. But we didn't know how to handle them. We didn't know how to use them. He found a way of using those principles and produce electric light. Now there's electric light in the four corners of the world and nobody thinks it is American. Mary Baker Eddy discovered the principles that Jesus knew with which he restored health and harmony to mankind. She taught that to mankind and it is available today in the four corners of the world. It's not cultural, it doesn't depend on the language and it's not an American thing. It's spiritual, it's universal. And that's what Christian science is. It's interesting to, see, interesting to see how Christian science can be applied anywhere in the world because its principle is the love of God in action, in human thinking, which is the action of the Christ restoring harmony to mankind. So going back to where we started, not everybody is on a mission like that nun was, of working with the refugees. But everybody is moved by what we hear. And we are engaged in prayer that helps it. That old questions of those two guys who followed Jesus and asked him, Master, where do you live? That question is still speaking. And today, people can ask the Christ. Jesus isn't here to answer. But that Christ which invited those two young men, come and see, and invited them to spend the afternoon with them in Jesus' home, that Christ is answering to all mankind, come and see, and is showing the home, the right spot in God's presence for all mankind. Everyone on earth has a place where to find home. And the Christ is inviting everybody to see where he is. The Christ is saying, come and see. And is preparing a home for everybody. This is not old history. And we can know that. And when we do that, we're helping everybody. We're not indifferent. Divine love demands and allows everybody to see and feel his presence. We don't need to react to apparent, the apparent power of evil. We need to respond to the presence of divine love. Respond to the presence of God. We can do that. This love is constantly making us receptive to it. Us, and I mean everybody on earth. 
talking about pilgrimage and Mrs. Eddy's pilgrimage and our pilgrimage towards home, I'll end with a sentence that is the closing of a chapter in Science and Health called Footsteps of Truth. Now, the idea of footsteps indicate a pilgrimage. And that chapter, Footsteps of Truth, closes with a sentence with which I'd like to close this lecture. It says, Pilgrim on earth, thy home is heaven. Stranger, thou art the guest of God. Thank you.